Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. We're gonna have a good time today, but what I wanna do first is, um, do you wanna tell everyone to put it on speaker? speaker? view, speaker view is the best view. So then you can see who's talking and it's your biggest screen. So, yeah. so speaker view for, for the um, instructions will be the best, uh, best to view on speaker. Yeah. Um, I also want to introduce um, our star today, uh, realtor and broker John Pinto. Uh, John Pinto has spent 46 years, uh, 46 plus years selling residential real estate in the Bay Area. Uh, he has over 4,000 closed transactions to his credit and he is also a home chef and has been the featured chef on several local cable shows. So you will often find him cooking dinner at a client's home as a thank you after close of escrow. Um, and you can find him discussing the ins and outs of the culinary world with some of the local chefs in the foodie rich atmosphere of Napa, California. So thank you, John. Yay! We're excited. Thanks for doing this, John. We appreciate it. Thank you. Are we ready to rock and roll now? I just want to give one more shout out to our sponsors. Our bronze sponsors are 101 Loan, uh, Rob McCarthy. Thanks, Rob. We love you. David Schindler with State Farm. Great agent. And uh, Diana Legospi with Guild Mortgage. Thank Thanks. you guys always for being a part of YPN. Thank you. Thank you. And then I'll, our gold sponsor, um, he's the best, is Chris from Western Way Termite Services. And he offers a, a, a lot of services besides termite. Uh, so be, feel free to reach out to him. Spencer's going to put um, all the information of our sponsors in the uh, chat so that you can take down their name and phone number and give them a call. They'll take great care of your clients. Yeah, that guy Chris is on point. You should give him a call if you need a pest inspector. I was in need of one and he filled um, my need and he's great and he's very articulate. Um, I like that in an inspector. Wow, mm -hmm. we got people popping in left and right. John, are you ready to get it on? I'm ready to rock and roll. And by the way, on the sponsors, uh, Rob McCarthy and I have closed uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, transactions together. Uh, there was a while that we were doing a lot of uh, home buyer seminars together uh, back in the uh, 80s, 90s, and uh, uh, tens, I guess you would call it, or zeros. So hello, Rob McCarthy. Oh, you know what? Rob McCarthy helped my business. He was the first deal I did and we teamed up and he helped me do six deals in the next year and he's been my lender partner ever since. So, very good, very good. Very good. Right. Funny. I didn't even know we were connected like that. Okay, let's John. Get rolling. Let's get rolling. Let's uh, do a little quick prep here. First of all, a watched pot never boiled, so I'm going to start uh, turning on the burner for my hot water. Okay, so that's good. And uh, the first uh, couple of things that we're going to do, we're going to roast some uh, heirloom tomatoes, and we're also going to roast some Nicola potatoes in the uh, oven. Now, normally I would roast those uh, at about 250 and just leave them in for four or five hours. Uh, but I'll put them in at uh, 300 and see if uh, they make any headway uh, by the time this uh, presentation is over. So 300, 300 degrees. Convection roast. So what do we got here? We got heirloom tomatoes, a baking pan, a cutting board, extra virgin olive oil, kosher salt. I'm going to start with that. Then we're going to go to Nicola potatoes. Now, somebody out there, check out Nicola tomato, uh, potatoes, N-I-C-O-L-A. Nicola potatoes. The vendor told me they have a lower glycemic uh, index if you're diabetic or you're trying to watch your carbohydrates. And we're going to make those with some dried rosemary, again, the olive oil, again, the salt. Now, when you're roasting the potatoes, you want to flip the pan around every half hour so when the convection is moving the air around, it doesn't get singed in one corner. And you definitely want to flip them every now and then. Otherwise, you'll get the bottom burned and the top soft. Okay, then we're going to do some uncased, in this case, we have cased butifada sausage a la uh, Catalan sausage from Spain. I couldn't find any uh, fennel sausage, sweet fennel sausage, 
so you make do. I couldn't find any uncased sausage. Usually if you go to the butcher, they will uncase it for you. I just like to do as little work as I possibly can. Uh, when I went for the Odietti pasta, they didn't have any. They had this gnocchietti, but the key thing is it's rustichella pasta. You cannot go wrong with rustichella pasta as far as I'm concerned. It's the best dried pasta in the universe. Now, the northern Italians do more fresh pasta. The southern Italians do more dried pasta. I think it uh, kept better in uh, the old days when they had bubonic clay. Um, I don't think we have bubonic clay here too much, but we're not that far off right now. Okay, then we've got some asparagus, an asparagus steamer. We're going to do uh, the steamed asparagus with olive oil, lemon juice, lemon zest, salt, pepper, and hot paprika. How does that sound? That's pretty fancy pants. Then we are going to do some uh, Rodriguez Farms in Monterey uh, strawberries with cracked black pepper and Sepe Groves up in Solano County strawberry vinegar. What the heck? Sounds like a good plan to me. Uh, I've got my, I couldn't find broccoli rabe, although Jen, I understand you found broccoli rabe. You did? Good for you. Yeah, I found it um, at Whole Foods. Oh, beautiful. Just forget the stems, chop those off. Uh, give it a good chop, uh, and uh, we're going to have to beat the hell out of that broccoli rabe in the pan. Uh, but I got uh, uh, Russian red kale. There's probably some microphones in there picking up the uh, top secrets. And uh, then... We are going to do a fennel salad with mandarin oranges. Now, I will show you this, okay? Guess which fennel came from the farmer's market and guess which fennel came from the supermarket? Yes, the anemic fennel came from the supermarket. So in general, you want to really try to get your food in the farmer's market. First of all, with COVID-19, uh, it's been pretty much uh, documented that inside is a lot more dangerous than outside. So I'm going to give you some of the basics of where I shop. I go to a farmer's market every Tuesday and uh, Saturday. And despite my youthful appearance, I am more than qualified to get into senior hour from 8 to 9 a.m., which is good. You better get there at 20 to eight o'clock so that way you can get in on the first pass because the farmer's market does a really good job with six foot spacing, minimizing the number of people that come in. You gotta wear a mask, minimal exchange of cash, mostly credit cards. I also use uh, Farm Fresh to You. That's a uh, cooperative of uh, different uh, farmers and farmers markets and you can order online. I think they start taking their orders on Thursday afternoon, and you've got to be Johnny on the spot to make sure the inventory doesn't uh, sell out. And uh, I do a lot of shopping on uh, Amazon uh, for things like dried pasta, San Marzano tomatoes. And, um, and then uh, Ellen White's uh, Instacart, who's the vendor that delivers for Raleigh's Knob Hill and a few other supermarkets, although that is not my... Uh, first uh, preference, but for paper products and things of that nature, you know, you could certainly use Amazon and uh, uh, and uh, Instacart. Hey, John. Hey, John. John, we've yeah. got a question from... I got it, Will. Thank you. Um, yeah. the, can you tell me the difference between broccolini and broccoli, Rob? Uh, broccolini is more stem. Um... There's not much to it. Uh, you know, probably uh, I would, with broccolini, I would uh, uh, steam it until it was tender and then uh, finish it with olive oil, lemon, lemon zest, uh, salt and pepper, and call it a day. Brooklyn out there is gonna have, a, is gonna be a lot more leafy. So you got a lot more to work with with the sazicha. Uh, so at this particular point in time, I'm going to give myself a little space 
I am going to remove the potatoes. Must have been crazy when I agreed to cook all these things. I, I, nobody forced me to cook all these things, but. Uh, yes, let's be clear. You made this recipe, this menu on your own, John Peter. I know, I know. Well, you know, the, the common denominator in the recipes is they're pretty simple. And um, and you might know, notice that other than the sausage, it's mostly plant-based. Now, I will say this. I went to see Sarah, uh, the nutritionist at Kaiser, and Sarah made it very plain. And she says, plant-based, no inflammation, non-plant-based, inflammation. Inflammation is the cause of most illnesses and mortality. Uh, so I said, I get it. I get it. So I still like my pork sausage. I still like my calamari, my clams, my mussels, uh, salmon every now and then. Uh, I do not uh, embark on offal too much uh, anymore. Sweetbreads, tongue, tripe, uh, things of that nature. That's uh, not good for my uric acid and that causes gout. Uh, but every now and then I will eat a little meat especially pork, because most of us have a vitamin B, uh, B12 deficiency, and you can certainly get that either from nutritional yeast or pork will have it. So without further ado, let's get started here. So the baking pan, let's give it some olive oil. Eventually, we do have to start cooking. Is there anybody that's actually I cooking? I forgot why we were here, John. <laughs> what was that? I completely forgot why we were here. This is so exciting. Let's get it on. <laughs> well, we're here to talk, relate. Okay, now the key thing with, let me grab my, my little cleaver. Okay, first of all, look at this thing, okay? Now, some people have been over my house. I know Will Shea has been over my house. And when people come over my house and they want to start chatting in the kitchen, and I usually got this kind of stuff set up, I said, the wine is over there, pour yourself a glass, get the hell out of the kitchen, and go into the backyard. And the reason is, you got sharp knives, you got cleavers, you got boiling water, you got fire. So, you know, we got to stay focused. So anyway, we have a limit on how much real estate we have in this baking pan. So I'm gonna suggest that we cut the tomatoes fairly thick uh, because they're gonna desiccate and get skinny and you wanna make sure that they still have some substance when they shrink to almost nothing in the oven. So I am gonna go one, two, three, Four, five, cut off the little stem. Got my handy dandy garbage can right here. And we're gonna start organizing in, in here and hope that we have enough real estate. We'll see how that works out. Uh, these are heirloom tomatoes. Uh, I usually get uh, heirloom yellow tomatoes from a, a pair of Ukrainian brothers at the farmer's market. They, they really have some beautiful tomatoes. And I always have oven dried tomatoes in the uh, refrigerator. Now, does anybody want to volunteer what they would use oven dried tomatoes for? I like to use them in sandwiches. That's I like what orange is. Put on a sandwich. Yeah, you could uh, toss them with pasta. I think I might have enough room here. Jody would like to know what tomatoes? Heirloom. Well, they're heirloom tomatoes. Uh, you know, you can tell they're kind of like a little purpley red. Um, you know, you just. Just, uh, like I say, go to the farmer's market. Whole Foods has got a pretty good produce section. 
Um, and, you know, ask the vendor, uh, ask the fruit of Vendelo, as they call them in Naples. Ask the, uh, the fruit specialist, he's always there with a hose, uh, uh, filling the display case, and ask him what he thinks the best uh, tomato is going to be for oven drying. He'll tell you. The nice thing about going to the farmer's market or whatever your equivalent is of the farmer's market is, you know, if you have a mushroom vendor or a tomato vendor uh, or a meat vendor or a chicken vendor or a seafood vendor, is you not only get to buy the food from them, uh, but uh, you also get a free education from them if you ask them questions on the best products to buy and the best way to prepare them. Oh, I'm at uh, 300 degrees in my convection oven now. By the way, you know, this is what I do for a good portion of the day. Normally, the only thing different today is I happen to be doing it with 75 uh, score white pianos on Zoom. Does Ellen come in and talk to you while you're cooking, or is she go do her own thing? Well, she's uh, watching on the phone. Ellen knows to stay clear of the <laughs> okay. kitchen. She knows to stay clear of the kitchen. Okay, you can see uh, we're doing pretty good here. And I happen to be out of uh, oven dried tomatoes at the moment. So this will be quite lovely. Um, by the way, another good use of these oven dried tomatoes is um, if you've ever made English muffin pizzas, um, you know, if you can get English muffins uh, you know, picked up by Model ba at Model Bakery or mailed from Model Bakery or you just Go to your artisanal baker and much nicer, huh? um, this is really you can do an English muffin pizza. You can put some uh, uh, English oh, muffin or so Italian bread uh, toasted. Uh, you put an oven dried tomato and some mozzarella and then maybe some oregano, some crushed red pepper and you're golden. So fortunately, my left hand has been handling the tomatoes. My right hand is dry. So here we go. Now, when you're salting these tomatoes, uh, tomatoes always need salt. Um, they need a lot of salt because they don't taste like anything. So we're gonna put plenty of salt here. I like kosher salt. It's a little less tinny. It, well, it's not tinny tasting like uh, regular table salt. John, somebody has a question about how long will they stay in the uh, how long will they stay in the refrigerator? You know, you do a pan like this, you're going to eat them up pretty quick. I mean, you know, usually within a week, they're all gobbled up. So, you keep tomatoes in your refrigerator? I keep them on my countertop. Well, no, no, no. After they're uh, after they're uh, dry. Okay. Oh, okay. I got it. Yes, that was Michael's question. How long would they stay in the oven? Dried tomatoes stay in a fridge. That was a question from people. Right. So and then the other, uh, the second question, John, if you have a moment. Yes. Uh, David wants to know if Fabrizio helped you prepare for today. Fabrizio? Yes, see. Si. Well, Chef Fabrizio from Sardinia, I haven't seen in years. Uh, but, you know, the answer to that question is who prepared me, who helped me prepare for today? Uh, number one. Uh, my mother and father, Francesco Pinto from uh, Napoli, oh, and then uh, my mother, uh, Annunziata Nancy Baroni Pinto from Brooklyn, and her family is from Castella Mata de Stabia. And, and then, uh, of course, my aunts, all my aunts, my Aunt Catherine, my Aunt Camilla, my Aunt Josie, my Aunt Gloria, my Aunt Eleanor, my oh. Aunt Helen, my Aunt Rita, and then all my cousins in Naples, especially my cousin Giannino, uh, his wife, Gabriella, their children, Antonella, Conchetta, Lucia, Antonio, 
my uh, cousin uh, Angelo Greco, a fruit of Vendolo in Torre del Greco. So uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Giannino in 1994 told me, you go to restaurants too much, you need to start cooking. I said, okay, and I started cooking and it was amazing. I remembered everything my mother and father did. It just Aww. kind of was there. So let's get this in the oven. So. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome, sure. I got stories. So we got the of glove. You want to make sure that you got your properly equipped. It's at 300 degrees. We're going to get this out of the way. If anybody saw that sexy man walking around, that's my husband. Now I will remind everybody the convection fan is going to blow the air in a certain direction where your tomatoes are going to get uh, a little singed possibly in the corners. So you do have to rotate it maybe every half hour. You don't have to worry about uh, flipping it because they're not going to burn. Okay. So. Now, what we're going to do is put the of glove away for a moment. I think I'm going to take a quick break and talk about, we talked about where to get the food. I hope you took notes on that. That's very, very important. Now, you have to have a proper rig. Um, so, I've got my little Mary Poppins insulated basket here. Okay. Oh, absolutely. You got people go to the farmer's market, they got a little plastic bag. Now you're going to cut it. I put my John, real quick before powder. you get in. Hey, John, we have, a, we have a question about your oven. What if you don't have a convection or a broiler? What would we do in this moment? Uh, that's fine. Just put bake. Just put bake. You're good. Okay, then I've got this thing which folds into like a handkerchief when I go to the farmer's market. So this is for my meat. Uh, my seafood to stay cold. This is for bread, bagels, stuff like that. And then I got my rolling rig, my carriage. So they see me coming at the farmer's market. This thing is heavy when I'm done. Okay, so now if you have to blow your nose or uh, go to the bathroom, uh, we could take uh, 15. I'm just going to clean my cutting board off. I think this is a great time for everybody to do a social. Um, why don't you pick your glasses up and share a moment? We'd love to have a drink with you. Okay, social hour is over. I'm back. Hey, John, how long will the tomatoes be in the oven for? Uh, you know, uh, as I alluded to before, uh, I like to do it in the morning and put it at 250 and just leave it there for like five or six hours. Just a nice slow roast. Okay, I hear you. So we're, and then um, Lucy wants to know if there's anything inside the pot because as, as our pot is boiling as well right now. Oh, let me check my water. Thank you for reminding me. I just uh, tilted the lid so it didn't boil over. Okay, so now we're going to get on to the potatoes. But, but what are we going to put the potatoes in the water? Is that what's happening? Uh, no, we're going to, we are going to, by the way, don't you love my little baskets? Very colorful. You can do blue. It's really pretty. Most of the stuff in my house is uh, golden blue, a la Amalfi Coast. Hey, John, on the John, on the tomatoes, it's Will. If I don't have five hours, how can I adjust if I want to get it done, um, you know, a little bit quicker? Uh, you know, you could, uh, well, first of all, you could put it on low and you could leave it on low. I mean, you could go out and come back. I mean, if you want to, put it on 200 and then turn it up. Um, you know, you could put it on uh, 300, but even at 300, I think it's going to take at least a couple hours. We're going to take a look at those tomatoes when this is over 
and you'll see that they're bubbling up, but they haven't really quote unquote roasted. So I would say uh, your answer is if you're going to do the roasted potato uh, tomatoes, you probably want to do it on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning when you're going to dedicate yourself uh, to being around the house in the kitchen so you could uh, uh, let it take its time at a low heat. Okay, so now we have the potatoes. Did anybody uh, look up Nicola potatoes and see if my intel that they are lower glycemic level is true or it's a fabrication? It's fake news. Can anybody tell me that? This is good. I'm keeping everybody happy. Now, uh, index of 58. Okay. That's, uh, well, let's compare that to a uh, Yukon Gold, which is what I would have used. Okay, so I just cut it in half two ways, and then I'm going to cut it one, two, three. Okay, so with a few cuts, I got those potatoes handled. So, one down sideways, one down through the middle, and then one, two, three. So with just a few cuts, you got a nice chopped potato. Oh yeah, Ellen was mentioning, uh, you want to do uniform sizes because you want them to, uh, cook at the same rate, so you can't be chopping them in all different uh, pieces. And because they are round, pay attention, be hyper-vigilant, because this is something where you can slice half a finger off, okay? That's why I use this, because this thing makes nice, big, clean cuts, this cleaver. One, two, three, Four, five cuts, and we have all those pieces. That uh, technique comes in even handier with, uh, I have a variation on onions, so I'm not going to use an onion today. But I can slice an onion into a gazillion pieces with like half a dozen cuts. Did anybody find out what the glycemic index of Yukon potatoes was by any chance? Because that would be your typical go-to. Now with the uh, potatoes, I like to have them around uh, in the refrigerator after I roast them because uh, they're good as an impromptu side dish, a snack, um, and every now and then, if I don't have anything else, I'll do a roasted potato frittata. Uh, that comes in handy. Just throw them in a nonstick pan or whatever your choice of pan is. Uh, carbon steel is very popular too. Uh, just, uh, you know, heat them through again. You don't have to cook them. And, uh, and then just mix your eggs, throw them on top of the, uh, potatoes and that makes for a really nice frittata. Okay, well done. More. By the way, usually I'll uh, take a, a day or an afternoon or a morning and prepare everything so that way I can be hitting it during the course of the week. John, David Gottlieb and Jody found out that they are the lowest on the glycemic scale, 58. Oh, Jody and Dave Gottlieb. Hi, Dave. How you doing? Long time no see. Hey, Where John. You doing? doing well. Are you in Sacramento now? Rockland. Rockland. Yeah, same neighborhood. That was my comment about for BTO. <laughs> Thanks for helping me uh, sell uh, those new houses, Dave. I appreciate it. But you're retired now. You live in La Dolce Vita, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, there he is. Look at him. Look at him. I just sold my uh, brother-in-law's house in San Jose. Oh, good. I'm glad to see you're still working. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> okay, so we'll put this over here. When you lay this cleaver down, make sure you put it in a secure spot where it's not going to fall on your foot, or else you're going to have a problem on your hands. Okay, so you can see it's not too crowded. It's okay. I would prefer it to be slightly less crowded. I'm going to put some olive oil here. A little bit goes a long way. And then we're going to do some kosher salt. Again, pretty generously because the potatoes don't have any taste on their own. So the kosher salt is going to bring out the taste. By the way, these Le Creuset uh, baking pans are really good. They're easy to clean. They conduct heat very nicely. Uh, they're a little pricey, but they are top of the mark. Okay, and then I got some dried rosemary. Most of you have rosemary uh, in your backyard, so you don't have to go out and buy it. I just didn't feel like uh, digging through the yard and pulling it all off. Okay. Hey, John. Yes, ma'am. How are you? Are you grinding down that rosemary? Or are you? What are you doing to it before you put it? The on rosemary the is going on top of the potatoes. Oh, you've got it in a shaker because we've got okay. some fresh stuff so here, so we should it. chop it up and then throw it in there. Uh, you could chop it up, or you could just uh, take your uh, finger and uh, mm -hmm. strip it from the uh, stem. Strip it from the stem, and just put it in like that. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, also, rosemary works. Uh, or you could also use uh, oregano. I would use both, but either one works good. Okay, we're gonna give it a little toss. So again, um, John, Jody wants to know if the fresh is embedded in the dry. Uh, I, I think the fresh is probably going to be a lot better than the dry. Um, I have a tendency, you know, to not necessarily go through fresh herbs fast enough, and they go bad on me before I. Although rosemary is going to have a pretty good shelf life, but. Uh, I have a tendency to use a lot of dried herbs because it's convenient. When I need them, I just go into the, uh, into the cupboard and I grab it and I don't have to worry about it going bad. All right, so shake it. Get the up glove. Okay, you see, there it is. Now again, of all the things I could have cooked today, why did I choose to do the Nicola potatoes. Well, first of all, as we alluded to, lowest glycemic index if you're diabetic too or watching your blood glucose. Uh, but number two, you know, having tasty potato chip kind of roasted potatoes where the inside is soft and the outside is hard and crispy. Uh, I mean, they're, they're addictive. Uh, when I take them to a cocktail party or serve them in my house. I think Will may have had these at one time. Will, did you have a taste these? They were amazing. Have. They were absolutely amazing. Yeah, they're like candy. They're like candy. Okay, so I figured since I had one thing in the convection oven, I put two things in the convection oven. But to be and fair, John, but to be fair, John, I usually get the leftovers. <laughs> Well, the, the point is, uh, Will, that if you're proactive and you're doing this kind of stuff, somebody could drop in to the house and you could say, I'm going to grab some leftovers. And people are going, these are leftovers? Because you're basically prepping the pantry, prepping the refrigerator. So I give you I, the Michelin star for your leftovers, John. You know this. Thank you. Thank you. So now that I thought of it, I opened that uh, oven to put the potatoes in. I think I'm going to take this opportunity to flip the tomatoes around.
and that work is done. That work is done. Uh, the only thing that uh, I will need to do is occasionally flip the tomatoes around and occasionally um, toss the potatoes so they don't get burnt on the bottom. So you gotta keep tossing them. If you do, they'll get crispy all the way around. So don't toss the tomatoes. Don't toss the tomatoes. Just flip it, don't toss the tomatoes. Okay, so this goes here. The rosemary is done. Now, if you only have a bed. single oven, um, what kind of tips can you give us at this moment? What kind of an oven? Yeah, well, um, so if you only have a single oven. Are you I have a double oven. No, I know, but some people don't. But you have a single oven. You got, you, you got two racks. Yeah, I got two racks. I put it in 300 degrees right now. That's what you're saying. Yeah, 300 degrees. I've never cooked my potatoes so low in my life, so I'm just a little confused. I want to make sure that I'm understanding. Well, uh, again, I'm used to leaving them in. Uh, you know, if you uh, want to turn it up, turn it up, see how they uh, go. I usually just slow roast them forever. I'm starting a little late today, so uh, perhaps I will uh, turn it up uh, later on after I watch them. 300 is actually pretty high uh, temperature for me. Okay. okay. You, you also repiece what, I'm sorry, John, I, I don't want to interrupt you, I'm just trying to, um, and then also what pasta did you get, the, will you just say the name again? Well, the name of the pasta is Rustichella. Um, if you're going to buy pasta, okay, for instance, if you're going to get Parmesan, you want it to be uh, from Parma. If you're going to get mozzarella, you want it to be from Campania. If you're going to get pasta, you want it to be from Abruzzo. If you're going to get tomatoes, you want it to be from Sarno um, in Southern Campania. Rustichella, in my opinion, is the uh, best pasta uh, out there. Uh, it's the only pasta where if it says to cook it for nine minutes, I cook it for nine minutes because it holds up, it stays al dente. Okay, so now, we're going to start on our next dish. I figure at some point in time, I need to actually put something in a cooking pan. So yesterday I went to the cheesemonger and they didn't have any Locatelli Pecorino Romano, which was our grating cheese of choice in Brooklyn. Um, Pecorino Romano from Rome. This is uh, Pecorino from Sardinia. Now, the interesting thing about Pecorino from Sardinia is a lot of times it has black peppercorns in it. It's very tasty. I don't see black peppercorns in this one. But um, the Pecorino, I like to grate better than the Parmigiano. It's gamier, it's saltier, um, it's nice and hard. And later on, we will grate it here. I've got a little reservoir. Here, we'll deal with that later on. Okay, so we'll put the pasta to the side. Now, did anyone succeed in actually finding untaste Italian sweet sauce? Yes, that's sprouts. You did, you did, okay. Well, more often than not, I can't. So I failed on multiple levels. I did not, I was not able to secure Italian sweet fennel sausage. That's my first choice and the typical ingredient for this dish. Um, I've seen it made with uh, Calabrese hot sausage, which is not that hot. There's just a little Calabrese uh, pepperoncini in there, the uh, hot chili peppers. Uh, in this case, I have a couple of vendors at the farmer's market uh, that uh, have uh, Catalan style butifara. Um, Sausage, ingredients, pork, salt, garlic, vinegar, powder, and spices. So at this particular point in time, before I attack this, I am going to get my extra virgin olive oil. And Spencer, we're finally going to get an opportunity for that cooktop view. Hey, John, before you go into that, oh, wow. That's too, exciting. Too late. Too late. Pretty, pretty awesome. I moved. Okay, so a little but can I have a sausage question for you. 
All I, don't, I also had a problem finding a sweet sausage, so I was able to find a hot pork Italian sausage. And then, and then regular pork Italian sausage. Do you think there's a preference in this recipe? Um, well, okay, so first of all, I put the extra virgin olive oil in the pan, you know, on that high. Okay, so there we go. Now you asked me about what the preferred sausage is. Yes, please. Um, the preferred sausage is the Italian sweet fennel sausage with the little black fennel seeds in it. No, I meant between or green, the green fennel seeds. And then if you can't find that, then the Calabrese um, uh, hot sausage. And it's easier if you could get uncased. And you're going to find out why right now. Got my cut go handy scissors. These things come in very handy in the kitchen. Hey John, if you can find the the sausage that's like in the little in the um, in the tray, like a meat tray, uh, and it's already ground but not in sausage um, shape, does that work? You mean the coil? Uh, nope, just ground sausage in a in a meat tray. No, that's what you. Oh, I like the I I prefer the uncased ground sausage because it's easy to deal with. You don't have to do what I'm going to do right now which is to uncase these. See, I'm cutting the uh, casing off. I think I'll cut it off all of them first, keep the assembly line going. See, if you don't have to do this uncasing, that's one less thing that you gotta deal with. So to answer your question, Jody, yes. And where I would go, it, you know, back in the old neighborhood, we didn't only have butcher shops, we actually had pork stores. We, we'd go to the poultry store for chicken and eggs, we'd go to the butcher for beef, and we'd go to the pork store for pork. Um, so uh, I would find a good butcher that makes his own pork sausage, and you should be able to buy what you're alluding to, and that is the uncased sausage. By the way, uh, Jody, where did you find that uncased sausage for the benefit of our viewers? Well, it's it's not in sausage form. It's more more like just ground sausage. I think um, New York Sausage think, Company makes it, um, things like that. I think what you may be referring to oh, the bulk is, sausage. Ground, is ground uh, pork. Yeah, well, ground, is, they make it in ground sausage. Yeah, ground, you, you have to be mindful that ground pork and ground sausage are two different things. Um, if you're buying ground sausage, they've done most of your work for you already because you don't have to season it. If you get ground uh, pork, then it's got no seasoning, so you're going to have to get aggressive on seasoning it. Yeah. Yeah, New York Sausage Company, I believe, makes a ground sausage. It comes in a in a bulk um, little black package, the yeah, regular right. one. Um, that's your work. That, that's work. Now, I have a tendency to buy sausage from people that I know that are uh, hog farmers, where I know they're acorn-fed, free-range, no antibiotics, no hormones. So I'm very, very careful on where I source my meat and my sausage. Okay, so here we go. The uncased, the sausage that was cased is now uncased. Hey John, I put the uh, link for all of the Ruscatella pasta uh, for Amazon for everyone in the chat. Oh, hold on. Thank you, Will. Oh, you You're welcome, the... Ellen. Thank you, Will. Good, thank you. Okay, so since I used the scissors and this thing for pork, this is going in the sink. Now, 
Now, Will, here is the dreaded pitchfork. The dreaded pitchfork. Now, I promise you, Will, I promise you, Will is my quality control. And he says, which is true, this is way too noisy on the stainless steel, but it's the only way I'm going to be able to break up that soil. I can't use a plastic spatula. Do your best. <laughs> OK, look at that. There we go. No grading. Oh, there's a little noise. Fortunately, I don't have the uh, microphone on uh, the cooktop iPhone. I'm going to turn this up. That looks good, John. I'm really getting excited. Yes. Yeah. Now, I'm going to give you a two for one here. Will, I am sorry to violate your sensibilities, but thank you for the quality control. I appreciate it. Now, I'm going to give you guys a two for one here. Okay, here's your two for one. <laughs> now, we've got the sausage in there going. There's something called ragu du sazicha. Okay, San Marzano tomatoes. San Marzano tomatoes. And when you order from Amazon, make sure that you order 28 ounces, not 90 ounces. <laughs> Maybe I'll start reading when I order something, but slow the, down. <laughs> the key thing is with the ground sausage, if you choose to do the ragu du sazicha, then you just brown the sausage, throw in a can of San Marzano tomatoes. You don't need to add salt. Bay leaf, oregano, parsley, garlic, nothing. It's just the, it's, uh, it's seasoned with the sausage. So, but we're not going to make that today. But you do have that available for future reference. I'll just leave that here. Cento's a good, uh, a good uh, mark for uh, San Marzano tomatoes. Make sure the San Marzano, uh, Marzano tomatoes are not imposters that they are from Sarno, they are from Campania, okay? Let me take a look at uh, my sausage. I don't know about anybody else, but that's the first time I've ever taken the casing off sausage, John, and you're kind of blowing my mind. Maybe that's very simple, but I just have never done this before. All done. Hey, John, are you on a high heat or a medium heat on the... Um... Oh, that's a very good question, Will. Um, as long as I'm watching it, it's on medium high heat, um, but... This is my all clad LTD, which is basically um, aluminum. Well, it's, it, it's aluminum and a stainless interior. The aluminum is much more forgiving than my all clad copper clad. Um, that's uh, basically stainless, stainless, aluminum, aluminum with copper in the center. And that stuff, if you turn it on too high and you turn around, you got charcoal in three minutes. So as long as I'm watching it, uh, it's on medium high heat. 
Jody put in a great link for New York style sausage in the chat and I guess a score member is a part owner. So that's pretty cool. Thank you, Jody. Now notice um, I'm breaking the sausage up. You got to continue to break it up. Jody wants to know where you got your amazing fork. Okay, so who wants to know where I got my fork? Jody, I got that fork at a restaurant supply place in NOLA, uh, outside of Naples in the province of Campania. I was in my glory in that uh, restaurant supply place. So there's plenty of restaurant supply places uh, in uh, the Bay Area. Uh, and they're starting to open now. So, uh, or you can probably look at restaurant supply online. I find it's a very handy, but somewhat noisy, well, uh, utensil, but uh, I, I do like it. Now, I think what I'll do is if I find a bottle of wine with a screw top in my collection, uh, that usually winds up on my kitchen table. Maybe I drink a little bit. I'm going to do a little deglazing. What's the significance of the screw top, John? <laughs> well, <laughs> let, let's just say, you know, a screw top has become more uh, acceptable. Uh, but if I'm going to use a wine for cooking, chances are I'm not going to use a 2000 England Rubicon, which happens to have a fork. Um, so you, you, you don't want to use bad wine to cook with, but uh, uh, let's just say that the screw top wine might be a little bit less acceptable and a little bit easier for one to sacrifice uh, to deglaze. So you're okay with me taking out the bag from the box wine and stabbing a straw through it and making it an adult version of a Capri Sun then. You're okay with that? I, I, I'm going to cut you loose on that one. You're good to go. So John, we're on a, we're on a medium high heat. We're watching this cook. How long do you think the three, three or four sausages will take to to cook to to your standard you're thinking 10 15 or 7 to 8 what do you think you know um, maybe 10 or 15 i mean i'm going to wait until it's a little crispy on the outside and uh um the uh, the glaze has uh, has dissipated explain why you do the why do i do the deglaze uh, the, the glaze is going to uh, give the sausage a little bit more uh, sweetness, which I like. So that's why I uh, deglaze. It's going to help you pick up some of those tasty bits off the uh, bottom of the uh, of the pan. John, yes. are you cooking the sausage with Am I cooking the sausage as well? Oh yeah, extra virgin olive oil. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So are we letting the, the glaze evaporate um, or are we totally reducing it? What are we doing there? How do we know? Uh, just eyeballing it, uh, making sure that all the, uh, most of the liquid is gone. Let me take a look. Hey, John, can you give us the story of your uh, chef's assistant to your left there? Chef Giovanni? Yes. What's the chef story Giovanni. behind that guy? Yeah, this is almost ready.
Yes, this is my alter ego right here. Jeff Giovanni. All right, so now I'm going to do something a little easier. We got balsamic strawberries. Okay, now uh, I've got two recipes here that are going to be really nice for you to, again, have in your refrigerator, um, bring to a potpourri. You know, usually when uh, people go to a potpourri, everybody brings meat. Nobody brings fruit or vegetables. So, a oh, hot luck. You know, can we put off the sausage? Is the sausage done? It's looking really good. Thank you. Do we turn it off? I'll turn it down. Okay, you're gonna put this on low, like like keeping it warm, kind of low. Yeah, yeah. Asking as a novice. Yeah, I'll turn that on low. Okay, so now let's prep for our next dish. I got to give myself a break, something easy. So now we're on to the strawberries. So this is really simple. Got a little sharp baby knife. Cut the stem off. There goes the balsamic vinegar, but it's still intact. I like when Julia Child had the uh, chicken go flying off her island. That uh, so as it sounds a little enthusiastic, I think I'll turn it down. So the strawberries that I'm doing now are real simple. Uh, as I mentioned, I get them from Rodriguez Farms in Monterey. They always have a very excellent selection. Um, they're probably uh, at your local farmer's market. Strawberries uh, also are uh, good as well as cherries for reducing uric acid. Um, Will knows all about uh, uric acid. At the nominating committee last year, I was uh, voted to be on the nominating committee and I was basically down and out for two months with gout. My uric acid was 9.2. Uh, normal is six. I am happy to say that my uric acid is down from 9.2 to seven. So I am very close to being normal again on my uric acid and I haven't had gout uh, since that episode last year, which I guess will was right about a year ago, right? Because that's what nominating yes, committee, nominating committee just meant for a score. Are you quartering or having the strawberries? I'm uh, basically quartering them a long way. Okay. If I cut them any smaller, um, there won't be much to them. They, they you know, they hold together. Um, can you? You're. Are you cutting them in half after you cut the stems off? Uh, I am cutting the stem off. And then I am cutting them in quarters long way. Because if I cut them in half and then try to tackle them, uh, they wouldn't hold together if I see I'm going, I don't know if you can see. Hold on. It, it is a little bit harder, but if you just verbalize it, I think everybody understands. Thank you. Hold on. I mean, here we go. 
Here we go. Okay, so here we go. One, two, your left hand is just three. Blocking what you're doing. Oops, hold on. <laughs> oh boy. So anyway, um, here we go. So I'm cutting it here, then here, then here. So three slices for three cuts, four slices. I guess you could cut them down the center first. That, that works. I just did that. That works. As long as they hold together. Okay, almost there. Okay, so it looks like we've got a few people actually cooking. Charlene, are you cooking? Hey, girls, good to see you. And Lucy, are you cooking? Yeah, are you able to unmute? Oh. I'm drinking, Jen. <laughs> I'm smelling my potatoes. I'm smelling my potatoes. So when you smell them, that means that it's time to flip them. Man, John, you are on point. I can smell my potatoes too. I'm going to flip them. Yeah, fortunately, uh, I'm not getting any sticking on the bottom. I did not realize what I was smelling until you said it. I got those just in the nick of time. The rosemary smells nice. And I'm, what, while I'm at it, I'm going to rotate the uh, tomatoes again. Okay. All the glove goes back in its little holding pattern. Do you have to flip the tomatoes too, or are those good to just go? What was that? Do you have to flip the, the, flip the tomatoes as well? Or no. are the tomatoes just good? I did not flip the tomatoes. I just uh, rotated the pan 180 degrees. So I wouldn't get uh, uh, singed corners from the convection oven. You can see this is work. Whoever signed on to this uh, signed on for some work. But the nice thing is you'll have food, you know, for a week. I think I heard Jen say her hot water was boiling. Ditto. Over here. Yeah, it's been boiling a while. I turned it off first. Yeah, I turned it down but at least I don't have to worry about it being ready. I put it back in or put it back on or keep it on low? Um, I put it on low because it's going to take, if you turn it off, it's going to take a long time to, to heat up again. Let me see how the uh, sausage is doing. The sausage is starting to smell like something, so that's good. You don't want to take it out prematurely. I think it could stay in a little bit longer while I finish this dish up. And then we'll get to the next stage on the sausage with the greens. Ellen and I uh, consume 12 baskets of strawberries a week 
and eight baskets of cherries a week while they're in season. I think that's why my uric acid is down. Nutritionist Sarah from Kaiser would be proud of me. As a matter of fact, I terrorized the class. Everybody was moaning and groaning about it, how they have no time to go shopping to figure out what's going to be on their personal healthy menu. And I lambasted everybody and said, you know, you still have the choice of making changes that will positively affect your health. At some point in time, you will be past the point of no return and you will not have the choice. So, you know, it's all about being proactive, um, understanding what's in season and making sure you stock your pantry and your refrigerator with the most uh, amount of in season fruits and vegetables. I think I did a video a couple of uh, months on my refrigerator. Uh, I dared anybody to show me a video of the inside of their refrigerator. And I was shocked to see that uh, it was mostly fruits and vegetables. You know, I don't consider myself 100% uh, plant-based, vegetarian, vegan, libertarian, or any of that. Uh, but, you know, the fact of the matter is, I eat uh, a lot more fruit and vegetables uh, than I used to. Almost there. Just a few, few, a few more. Is anybody out there doing these strawberries? Everyone will have the ability to unmute yourself. So if, if anyone wants Lucy, to, you can either raise your hand oh, or just well, you unmute. Chat, you chat. Lucy, Lucy, good for you, Lucy. Lucy, where did you get your chair, uh, your strawberries? Did you get them at the supermarket, farmer's market, drive down to Monterey, Watsonville, where, wherever? Lucy, you're on mute. Let's go ahead, go ahead and unmute yourself, Lucy. Sean, there's a question up here. Who's out of town with strawberries? Okay. <laughs> No, I um, I got all the stuff today. I thought I would go to Knob Hill and just got everything I needed, right? And Good for you. Yeah, so, well, I'm a cook too, you know. I'm not like you, pro you know, professionally like you, but I do cook every day. I'm Portuguese, so Italian and Portuguese, we, we You're cook. not like, you mean an obnoxious New Yorker? <laughs> I'm a California, Portuguese California. <laughs> <laughs> So I got shells. What I got was shells, little shells, and I'll just do with that. And next time I'll just order, you know. Where do you live? I live in San Jose, um, by Almaden, Almaden and Blossom Valley. They gotta have a farmer's market down there. You're not that far well, they away. They do, they do, but you know, it's, yeah, I can always go there, yeah. 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 But I didn't have your recipe until, I mean, I didn't look at it until today, so. Oh, well. Yeah. You got it now. Yeah. Okay, last strawberry. Only one strawberry got dumped. Okay. But that's a pound of strawberry, pound and a half, two uh, pounds. No, I don't How deal much? in pounds. I, I go to the strawberry, I, I go to Rodriguez Farms, and they usually got a deal for six baskets for uh, 20 bucks. I say, sign me up. Okay, so, so far so good. Now with the application of the balsamic vinegar, you know, I recommend uh, aged eight years, preferably from uh, uh, Modena. Um, now you can't, don't do too little, don't do too much. Let's see what that means. Oh, this is thick. Look at, oh boy, that is thick. Is that aged or is it? Uh, uh, you know, 
that age, but it certainly is reduced. This is just a local vendor. Um, you know, I like to go local if I can. Sepe, Sepe Groves, S-E-P-A-Y. Okay, now here's the crazy thing about this recipe. Coarse black pepper, lots of it. Uh-oh, well, I got a squeaky, I got a squeaky uh, pepper milk. Hold Are you gonna you go. WD-40 that? <laughs> but there you are. So, you're doing that on purpose. Yeah, so I'm just gonna toss it. Hey, John, did that balsamic have a flavor to it? The black pepper? No, the balsamic vinegar. Oh, it, it, you know, the strawberries are actually not that sweet. The strawberries are a little tart. Um, so um, the balsamic really complements the sweetness. And by the way, just uh, make a note, uh, black pepper, really you're going to get more bonus recipes here black pepper really likes strawberries it really likes mussels okay so if you just buy uh two pounds a pound per person of mussels just throw it in a pan don't crowd them put in a whole boatload of black pepper cover it crank it up toast some italian bread put it at the bottom of a bowl as the mussels open up a little bit more um, black pepper also goes well with uh, fresh ricotta cheese. Uh, so, uh, you know, just do some Italian bread, smear some uh, ricotta cheese, some black pepper, you're golden. So those are the three go-tos with uh, black pepper. But as you can see, now the balsamic is not really pulling. There's a little bit more on the bottom than I prefer. So I'm going to keep tossing it so that the balsamic gets off the bottom and on my strawberries. Guaranteed, guaranteed big hit at your potluck. Uh, you know, uh, balsamic vinegar is from grapes. It's like wine. Um, so, yeah, it, it does matter. I mean, if you have a balsamic from Lobina and it's eight years or older, you're going to be golden. What other fruits are good to use besides strawberries if you don't have strawberries on hand? Um, let's see. Well, then it would be a different recipe. <laughs> then it'd be a different recipe, because the black pepper and the balsamic just go particularly good with the strawberries. Okay. Um, and you know, I find that Rodriguez Farm seems to be at the farmers market all the time, so they must have some kind of a hot house uh, because the strawberries just keep showing up. <laughs> now let's see if I have a place for the strawberries in my refrigerator. How nice! I have a place. For my strawberries, what a pleasant surprise. Okay, so now we are going to revisit the sazicha. Let's get rid of some of this cutlery. Get rid of the strawberry cutting board. Okay, so here is where we try to minimize the use of uh, pots and pans and pyrexes. So, I'm going over to my handy dandy pyrex. 
try to keep everything logistically handy. Okay, so here's my Pyrex, Pyrex, Pyrex. So now I'm going to take these, I'm going to flip the sausage over one more time. And I'm going to reserve it in the Pyrex because I will have leftovers. Okay, so this is serving two purposes. Uh, I am reserving my sausage, my sausage in it, but also um, later on when I save leftovers, I'll use this Pyrex, so I use it twice. Okay, so. John, before you get too far away, this is Larry Tringali. Do you have a plan for that sauce back there, the sausage juice? Uh, the sausage, yes, I do, as a matter of fact. Funny you should ask. Well, I, I didn't want you to dump it before you told us what it was. Okay. Through the miracle of TV, I have the Russian red kale all ready to go. Now, as I mentioned to everybody today, my preference would have been broccoli rabi. Uh, but I couldn't find it. We used to use Andy Boy Broccoli Robbie when we were kids, cut the stems, chop it up pretty good. Um, if I can't find that, then I like the Cabo Nero, the uh, Tuscan kale. Uh, you could use spinach, although spinach doesn't have enough uh, body to it, I think. You could use broccoli, you could use cauliflower, um, you could use broccolini. But in this case, well, you could use mustard greens too. So how exciting is this? I've got two of these because they reduce to nothing. Now I used four sausages. You could use six, you could use eight. It depends on how you want to uh, uh, apportion it. It's your choice. But hey, here Josh, goes. Can we ask yeah. you a question? What's that? What is your, what, what kind of cutting board are you using? Are you doing wood or plastic and why? Plastic? I'm just wondering if it's Question oh. is, are you doing wood or plastic and why? Oh, you mean for storing things? No. I'm sorry, we're looking for the cutting board. Oh, the cutting board, the, the cutting board is, uh, I actually have four of them spread out all over the place. Uh, they're uh, antimicrobial, so that's why I use them. Um, you know, wood is nice, those happen to be available. It came in a set of four. Uh, it uh, stores vertically. So it was convenient. Okay, here goes. John, what's the temp on the pan? Uh, the temp on the uh, cooktop? Yep. I've got it uh, at about uh, medium high. Thank you. Um, now, what I'm going to do is, you know, the greens like the tomatoes, like the potatoes, they got no taste. So we got to hit some uh, salt here. And can you remind me, was that kale or was that something else? This was Russian red kale. Russian red kale. Is there a difference between the kale and um, other kales? What makes it Russian? 
Uh, you know, uh, I my uh, farmer, my farmer Brown. I told him what I was looking for, and he says, um, you know, I don't broke my Robbie. I got this. Use this. So I said, fine. Okay. Now, let's see. You, you look at all that. Uh, Brooklyn Rabe or Russian Red Tail, you think, oh wow, look at all that. It ain't gonna be much soon. And then just quick question, did you stem it or did you just cut it? Because I know some some kales have a um, like for Portuguese cooking, some of it you gotta take that that stem out. Now, with the greens, um, you, in order to get them to reduce, you got to saute them and steam them. So I'm going to have to cover them. Don't you stem them? Stem them? Definitely. Uh, the stems on the broccoli rabi, the red Russian kale, uh, they, there's nothing you could do with them. They, they're not gonna cook down, they're not gonna get tender. Get rid of them. Thank you for asking that question. That's an important question. Okay, so hopefully we're gonna have room for this bunch of Russian red kale. We'll see momentarily. Let me kind of take a hit on it. Hey, John, us rookies over here, we're feeling a little inadequate. Um, this, um, this broccoli rabe that we have, we threw it in the pot, and then we're just supposed to put a lid over it, a little salt, and just let it cook down? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you have the rendered uh, pig fat from the sausage at the bottom of the pan. Uh, if it looks like you need a little bit more lipid, you can add a little ex uh, extra virgin olive oil. Uh, you probably chop the Brooklyn Abe uh, pretty good. Uh, you got rid of the stems. So throw it into the pan, uh, toss it so it gets coated with the pig fat and the olive oil, such as it is. Uh, sprinkle some kosher salt on top. Uh, crank it up the heat to medium high. And, uh, and you should see it start to wilt quickly. As a matter of fact, we're going to go back there and see okay so lucy's got some questions right now because um this is what lucy's saying she's using broccoli and it's getting dry what should i add maybe more olive oil hold on yeah lucy's broccoli. Well, after i got the uh green sizzling i don't hear anything what was the question jen um uh lucy wants to know because her broccoli is getting a little dry so she want to know if she should add more olive oil yeah, add some olive oil. You can even add a little water. Add some olive oil, add some olive oil, toss it, then add a little water to give it a little moisture. Um, uh, so yeah, give that a try. Alrighty, now we're on to the next thing. While we wait for that, I'm gonna turn down that, uh, those greens so that way I can focus on the next episode here. So we'll unfeature this. We will take the Cento San Marzano tomatoes away. Everybody knows what the drill is on that. On the uh, Cento San Marzano tomatoes, by the way, uh, Ellen finds uh, that uh, Buying those on Amazon, at least they used to be available on Amazon. Yes. They're still available on Amazon. What are they, about $3 a can? Now, by the way, let me give you an alternative to the San Marzano tomatoes. 
uh, in the town of Escalon. Does anybody know where Escalon is? It's, nope, uh, don't know where that is. Valley somewhere. Um, there's uh, a factory there called Luna Rosa, and they make what they call six in one tomatoes. They are pureed tomatoes. I think you could get them for $2 a can, and they are good. I would definitely suggest you always have a half a dozen of those uh, around the house. Okay, let's set up this next assembly line here. I am going to put my cleaver out of harm's way. Hopefully the potatoes will take care of themselves for a little while. Just take a peek. Oops. I think the potatoes need to get tossed. Especially at 300. They're smelling kind of sweet, kind of roasty. If you don't have a, was it Nicola type potatoes, just, just a regular yellow wax potato or a, a red um, baby potato work? Hold on, right there. So you can see how long it was since I last checked them, and they did stick a little bit, not a lot, but they did stick a little bit. What was the question? Um, if you didn't have, I think you call it a Nicola, or Nicola potato. Nicola so potato, yeah. Yellow, um, or wax potatoes, I think they call them, or just a regular red creamer. Would those work yeah. as well? I, you know, I think most potatoes are going to work good in this application. The conventional wisdom is Yukon Gold is going to work best in this application. Uh, and because of my predisposition for low glycemic uh, index, uh, the nickel has worked good. But, uh, you know, I, I have never used any potato that didn't work good in this application. So I think you're golden there. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so... Now we're going to have a logistical adventure. Uh, first of all, what do you think? You think I'll be able to fit all of that asparagus into this thing? What do you think? Anybody want to handicap, take, take some bets? So we're going to shovel it right in. I find the easiest way to do it is to Snap them, shove them in sideways. They snap off where they need to snap off. Um, again, I like to have asparagus uh, around the house. We're, we're just cutting the ends off? Is that what we're doing? I'm cutting the ends off, I'm snapping them. Yep, he's snapping them. Snapping them where they want to snap. Okay. It automatically snaps in the right place. While we're snapping, I'm going to take a look at my Russian red kale. And in the interest of keeping my fingertips, I am going to use the pot holder.
And then John, in, in the interest of showing, just because you have a great camera angle there at the stove, can you bring one asparagus over and show how it naturally has its own little snap? Um, yeah, sure, people sure. understand how that works? Okay, so here's the asparagus. Here's the asparagus, okay. Here's the asparagus. You notice it's white. So I kind of go to where it's not white anymore. And it snaps. John, can you take one over by the pot where we can get a close up of it? See Perfect. How'd that work, Will? That was perfection. Perfection. I aspire to perfection. So you can see there's a method to my madness because if you put it in sideways, you've got a better sh you got a better shot of putting in two bunches. We'll see how that works. Now I'm going to make this with um, I'm going to steam them. You know, you can when you smell them, you know they're ready. Um, then I'm going to toss them in olive oil. Uh, well, lemon juice, olive oil, salt, pepper, lemon zest, and uh, and some hot uh, paprika. Only because I like the way the hot paprika. I like the color of the the red paprika, and it's not that hot. Look at this. I think now. By the way, I did clean this before. I started prepping early. I was afraid. You know, I don't want people to be saddled with seeing me prep. Olive oil to the asparagus before we salt and pepper and paprika it? Uh, asparagus, the steamed asparagus, uh, then lemon juice, olive oil, salt, pepper, lemon zest, and uh, some smoked paprika. I have, I have one. Okay, thank Spanish you. paprika, Hungarian paprika. Are usually top of the mark. Can you talk about the different paprikas? There's Hungarian sweet, hot, smoked, what you would use them for in case somebody has only one kind. What would I use hot paprika for? Well, just there's all different kinds. There's hot, smoked, sweet, uh, uh, Hungarian, Spanish. Spanish. Yeah, you know, pap paprika is not something that the Neapolitans use that much. Uh, I started using it because I like the color. Um, I think uh, the uh, Creoles and the Cajuns use paprika in their Cajun spice, um, but I am not an expert on paprika. And not only did I get all of these things in here, but I have room to spare. Looky, looky there. Let's bring it over to the other view. Director Will, is that a good view? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, beautiful. Okay, so. These steamers are always a little tricky with the handles. You want to make sure you can get it down. There we go. Okay. In there. I do have a, an extra burner, a couple extra burners. Was that a steamer pot that you just showed? That was a steam. That was a, yeah, steamer, asparagus steamer. All right, I'm going to throw the rest of this kale in now. Oh Oh man, John, we threw all of our good stuff in right at the beginning. We didn't hold out anything. Are, are we ruined now? Is, is this over? No. 
I just said we put all of our broccoli rabe in right at the beginning, so we didn't hold anything back. I, I think the broccoli rabe is not as voluminous as this two bunches of red Russian kale. There's a lot of red Russian kale in there. So uh, let me add some salt to it. What what's that steamer pot that you just added? I want I want to add a link into the chat for whatever the the steamer pot that you put the asparagus in. Yeah, hold on. And then, as most of most if not all um, of your cookware all clad. Okay. That's that. This is the first time I've cooked with the Russian red kale. It seems to be extremely robust. I have some questions about yes. how did you have so much water today? Oh, <laughs> uh, many years ago, I went into Williams Sonoma. What a good question. Who asked that question? <laughs> I'm Jen and Laura. Okay. Many years ago, I went into Williams Sonoma one day, and they were in an embittered battle with all clad and they decided that in order to piss all clad off they would um, sell it at 70% discount so I told them I will take one of everything so I have a lot of all clad I'll show you something. That was probably the best purchase of your entire life. Yeah so here's my fancy pants um, asparagus Onto the other camera. Hold on. My fancy pans asparagus platter. Okay. I think I let those potatoes go just a minute too long before, so I'm going to toss them again. And you know what, Will, they are looking good uh, on the question about 300 degrees or what to do. You know, you just got to toss them more often. Hey, John, uh, if we don't have the steamer going, can we put the asparagus in the oven? I mean, we have a boiling pot of water. Let's just make sure our broth is done. John? Let me just take a look at my tomatoes. You can see these potatoes are starting to look roasted. They're getting there. The tomatoes are starting to reduce. I think I'll turn it down to 250. Hey, John. Ultimately, what did the tomatoes supposed to look like? Because I think I cooked mine too much at this point. What is what supposed to look like? The tomatoes. Because I, I, I tried to maybe flip mine, and they just kind of well, I mean, not disintegrated. But well, they are, are, are they slightly singed at the corners? Yes. Just slightly, right? 
Yeah, mm -hmm. just slightly, yeah. But the inside is good and cooked. You know what I mean? Um, you know, if they're not burnt, you could leave them in and uh, let them desiccate a little bit more. You know, I like to, I don't like them too watery. So at the end of the day, you, you want them dry as hell. I'm just trying to understand. Well, the they, they're not going to be dry as hell. They'll, they'll have some moisture. They'll still have some moisture, but uh, not because I pulled them out prematurely. You want them to at least be somewhat shriveled. Okay. Well, they haven't gotten there yet, so I'll, put, I'll keep it. Yeah. So be patient. Be patient. Okay. So now I'm going to check on the Russian red kale, and then I can't believe it. We're going to be on my final most unusual dish that we'll be uh, preparing today. Get this out of the way. And do you add the kale in two batches so that some is slightly wilted and some has a little more um, crunch or punch to it? More water with the kale. That was a good call. We do. Okay. That is a resilient kale. It's really, really going for you, huh? Lauren and I are going to do a social. If anyone wants to take a drink with us, cheers to you. Thanks for coming. Cheers to you ladies. Cheers. I think I'm gonna add a little bit more olive oil to the red kale. Could you add bacon to that? Would bacon be a good idea in this? Bacon in this be a great idea. Bacon would be a great idea. Uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, vendor that I got the sausage from uh, sells quote unquote bacon ends. So you would render the bacon ends crisp them up, have them uh, render all of their uh, pig fat, and then uh, throw the uh, greens, up, uh, red Russian kale, red, Russian red kale, whatever you got, spinach, broccoli, broccoli rabe, um, and uh, just saute steam it until it uh, steams down a little bit. All right, so now we are on our final leg here. I'm so hungry. And let me tell you, the guests in my house right now are chomping at the bit. Everything's smelling delicious. Oh, good. Okay. So. For a little bit. Fennel. Fennel. Going to have to get another receptacle to store this. I can see I'm going to have to do some rearranging with my refrigerator. This is where the fennel will go.
Just going to give my cleaver a quick rinse. Okay, so as I mentioned before, farmer's market fennel, supermarket fennel, size matters. So, John, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Toss these fronds. Okay, let's see. Let's cut this. All right, how are we going to cut this with the least amount of cuts? Huh? Hey, Don, I see you were wondering what farmer's market you go to. Could you go over that again for us, please? Uh, I, I go to uh, Napa uh, and Sonoma occasionally. Okay, so I'm cutting this fennel in quarters. And then I'm just going to chop it from there. Hey John, could you give us the close up of how you're chopping this? So you're just going against the what, what do you, Spencer? Yeah, so can you help us out here? We're not the You want to see me chopping the fennel? Well, it's just we've never done it before, so we have no idea where to begin and how to do it, to be honest. Okay, so okay, here's some. Fennel that's chopped. I'm gonna okay. Well, here. Over by the I'm gonna do my next move with the fennel. Maybe you could show us at the close-up um, camera next time because it's easier to see the details in that one. Yeah. Well, let's try this. I'll stretch my back out. There we go. I cut it in half, and okay. now. And don't smash it like this. You always want to cut through it. Cut through it. Yeah. So you cut that green frond top off? Yeah, that's garbage. That, get, that got tossed. Could that be used for something else at all? I'm just curious. What was that? Oh, you might. You might. I mean, Google it. And, or you know, is it just done? You might use. Okay, and I got one more teeny weeny. Oh, wait a minute. We got two more. I'm going to have a lot of fennel salad this week. Okay, so here goes. Moving this up so you can see it a little bit better. eaten fennel before um like that i know of maybe i have but does it did you eat it raw you just eat it raw and you put it in salad you, you can eat it raw raw is great it's a nice palate cleanser oh my it gets a yeah. little bit like licorice yeah yeah it's honest. yeah That's a my father used to have it in the house all the time i do so i you, do know that the flavor goes away a little bit once you cook it okay so Plus, i'm cutting it in half then I'm cutting it in half yet again. And then I'm cutting it again. I did take off a couple of the outer layers before. Is it a super strong licorice flavor? So like, I don't do black licorice period, but is this a more it, mild? Know, Black, black licorice, you know, let me put it to this way. Um, a cat and a dog both have, you know, four legs and a tail. But, you know, that, that's where the similarity ends. Um, it, it's a lot fresher than licorice. John, it's anise. It's anise. Yeah, anise. Anise is a little different. Diane Loverd um, shared that her family in Sicily tosses with pasta and her mom makes a soup with it. I've, I've seen, yeah, I've seen people uh, 
roast it, barbecue it. You know, I, I just kind of eat it uh, in salads or raw. Sicilians also used it as a pizza topping. You know, uh, I can see where, you know, if you want to have uh, a little something with a little freshness, I, I mean, it's much better than putting a damn pineapple on, you know? Okay, so. It's like, this comes from, it's like, those that don't like black licorice think that fennel is going to be black licorice flavoring, but it's milder, so it sounds like it's a misconception. Um, and that you should really give it a try, no matter what. Yeah, it's much more subtle than black licorice. Uh, well, and also, you're going to see when I add the, the other stuff to it. Uh, we're going to give it a little bit of a different flavor profile. Does the flavor intensify to the black licorice side if you cook it rather than it being raw? I just turned my oven down to 200 since I can't pay attention to uh, the tomatoes. I'm knee deep in everything else right now. Okay, so now, you know, for those ambitious souls out there, you can section off a mandarin and break it up yourself. I don't have the patience for that. So I just bought these Del Monte uh, mandarin sections. I I'm gonna, but I don't like the syrup, so I'm gonna get rid of the syrup. How's my kale? Let's see my kale. I'm going to turn the kale down. Okay, we're just going to do one more social since John's buzzing around. I mean, why not drink? Uh, put your glasses up. Cheers to you, John. What a great job you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so here's the uh, mandarin slices. Just toss it right in there. Here's to you, John. Thank you. Do you have a, a, a preference of wine or do you just cook and a drink after? <laughs> you know, I usually don't drink while I'm cooking because when I'm handling sharp objects, hot objects, and boiling objects, I try to keep a clear head. So here's the mint. Can't believe it. Almost done. Okay, here's where we get a little fancy pants here. Lemon zest. I even put lemon zest in my linguine and clams. I put lemon zest on sauteed salmon. I put lemon zest on everything. And that's, that's uh, the broccoli rabe, a.k.a. the kale. What was that? That's the broccoli rabe, a.k.a. the kale. Well, now I'm on a different dish. Now I am on the uh, mint with the mandarin 
sections and the fennel. This is a salad. Okay. So there you go. You got your lemon zest. This is from uh, lemons from my tree outside. Put some of this in here. Lemon juice. Meyer lemon, of course. Oh, uh, you know, sure. Yeah, I wish I had Sorrento lemons. Okay, John, I'm a Meyer, little- Meyer lemon would be good. Meyer Where? lemon would be good because it's a hybrid of an orange and a lemon. Um, John, are the greens that I'm seeing all mint? The what? The green is all mint. I was a little lazy. I could have tore it, but... No, but is it all mint? That's what I'm trying to understand. Yeah, it's all mint. I took all the leaves off the stems. So a little uh, extra virgin olive oil. So it's mint and oranges and EVOO and lemon. Lemon zest. So fennel, mandarin sections, fresh mint, lemon zest, lemon juice, olive oil, and pepper. Sorry about the squeaky wheel. Squeaky wheel gets the grease. And a little salt. So I said, now I will say this, even if you don't like fennel, you know, Ellen is not a big fan of uh, fennel, uh, but uh, this is a very refreshing summer salad. Yeah, I'm gonna stick it in the refrigerator if I can find a home for it in there. I'll take it over by the uh, other camera. Hey John, this is Spencer. We had a question come through. I know we have an ingredients list, but would you be able to put together some of these recipes with instructions and I could email everyone later this week? Recipes. That's a very quaint idea. <laughs> I think this is an intellectual property question and maybe you guys should um, reach out to your attorneys and speak yeah. to them. There is, there is this, this is as close as I have to a recipe. This is it. I, I, I am notoriously dead with recipes. But anyway, there's the... Uh, yeah, the John, we noticed. Thanks for describing how much you don't describe. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. So let's see if there's a, a home for the... Oh, that's oh, that's going on your uh, on the. At least he shared the ingredients with us on the list uh, that was emailed. Asparagus. I found a home for the fennel salad. I'm going to have to do something with those carrots. Okay, so now we're back on the asparagus. Let me just check on the kale.
This brushing tail is beeping. That gets turned down. What I'm going to do is I'm going to reintroduce the sausage in that pan. This will be where the leftover sausage and kale and pasta reside. And now I am going to revisit the asparagus. We're so excited because we have no idea what happened to the asparagus and how we were supposed to cook it because we don't have a steamer. So we're, we're riveted at this point. Well, the thing, the thing that will save us with the asparagus is even if I didn't pay attention to it and it gets a little mushy, ultimately it's going to be refrigerated. You continue to blow my mind, John Pinto. <laughs> okay, here we go. Asparagus. Sorry about that. This will. That was an all clad uh, steamer, correct? <laughs> I would be surprised if this was an old clad. <laughs> okay, so now we have our asparagus. I got my fancy pants little asparagus tool. Hold it against my shirt. So we didn't have any double Yeah, well, oh, well. Okay, so how long was the asparagus on for, John? What's that? How long was the asparagus on for? Uh, probably five minutes too long, but it'll firm up when I put it in a refrigerator. I'd say probably fifteen minutes is plenty. Okay, and that's that's once it's boiling, correct? Uh, uh, once it's steaming, yeah. Okay, so. John, what were you just doing with that tool right there and you were doing things? What were you doing? Well, I was handling the asparagus. So we're going to do more, more lemon zest on the asparagus. Obviously, you can see I like lemon zest. And you mentioned Meyer lemon before. If you don't have Meyer lemon, is grocery store lemon okay? You know, Meyer, uh, Eureka, Sorrento lemons, if you get your hands on them. They're all going to work. Meyer lemon is interesting because I think Meyer lemon is a hybrid lemon orange. So it's going to have a little bit more sweetness. But, you know, try a variety. See what you like. And, John, the zest is predominantly just using the uh, covering, correct? I'm just using the rind, but I'm going to use the le a lemon juice, too. Yeah, instead of white vinegar. The uh, Southern Italians uh, do like to use lemon juice for acidity rather than, uh, they, they will use white vinegar, but they use a lot of lemon juice. And they will actually use a lot of uh, red wine vinegar as opposed to balsamic vinegar, which you could use in this application, although the lemon zest wouldn't go good with the red wine vinegar. Okay, so now we got lemon, lemon juice. I think you could see where you could make vegetables interesting. Okay, we got. Salt. 
Can you talk about the difference between kosher salt and sea salt and table salt and Himalayan salt? Well, the, the, salt? The, the kosher salt is hollow, um, but I think the big difference is uh, um, the kosher salt doesn't taste as tinny and metallic as the table salt. Okay, so olive oil. And the hot paprika. Smoke paprika. Love that color. Is paprika more of a color thing? But there is hot, there's sweet, there's smoked. So is it a kind of a color and a what you want flavor kind of thing? Yeah, well, the hot is not that hot and the sweet is not that sweet. This is smoked. And oh yeah, it's smoked. So. Can you show it in the other camera? Yeah, I will, I will. Showing it in the other camera, okay. Just tossing it a little bit. Color. Will, I'm thinking that uh, 10, 15 minutes on this asparagus would be fine. When I put it in, the little, well, let's just say it's not al dente, but when I put it in the refrigerator, it'll reconstitute. Um, so, here we go. Very nice, very nice. All right, so now we're on the final leg. This will go here. This will go here. Pasta. Okay, so one of the key things with pasta you want to put enough salt but not too much. You can always add, you can't take out. So Okay, so now we're going to throw in this rusticella pasta. Let's see what the instructions are from Gianluigi Peduzzi and Stefania Peduzzi. I'm going to take nine minutes. Nine to 11 minutes. So I am going nine minutes. With most pasta, I would say, if it says eight minutes, go seven and start tasting it for salt and for al dentiness. But with rusticella, if it says nine to 11, I'm gonna go nine. Nine minutes. Got my handy dandy little basket. Don, how do you spell the name of that spaghetti? Your pronunciation wasn't as good. Rusticella, I'll tell you in a moment. Okay. If you go into the chat, I put the Amazon link for all of the uh, products, all of the pastas, different pastas under that brand name. They're all amazing. 
Okay. Okay, let's see. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? Rusticella, R U S T I C A T L L A. That's enough. You know, Rusticella, the roots of, is the home name. But Rusticella. Do you, um, do you recommend making your, I've, so I've heard that you, you should make your water as salty as the sea. Yeah, that's probably about right. I like that. That's a good plan. And then um, Will, Will Shea uh, shared where to get the um, pasta and I just re-put it in there for everybody. If they wanted the link. Hey, John, in general, how much salt are you putting in your pasta? I think that might be Gary's. I question. would say, if I had to take a guess, I'd say four tablespoons and then taste. I would say I didn't put enough. I'm going back. Because that's, that's your one and only chance to really save the pasta itself as opposed to whatever sauce you're going to put it in. Yeah. Okay, we're almost there. We're going to check out these tomatoes, check out the potatoes. Here's the potatoes. They're ready. Jen, you had a question about the tomatoes. You know, they're a little dark, a little singed on the outside. They could probably stay in a little bit longer, but I'm going to take them out. They'll be fine. They'll be sweet, which is what I want. Hey, John, would you just take them over to the, your close-up camera where your um, stove is, or your um, that burner is? Get them close. Ooh, perfect. Yeah, thank That's you. That's what I want to see. Yeah, we want to see that. Okay, good. We're going to compare ours. Thank you. Yeah, and, and by the way, they could have, they, they'd be fine staying in for a little longer. And I'm going to show you potatoes. And they would be fine staying in a little longer, too. Let's see where I'm going to put these things. Let's see if I can get all these tomatoes in this little cup. There it is. Will he be able to do it? Let's see. This looks kid friendly so far too. <laughs> okay. Well, here goes. One. Two, three, four, five, six, 
six, seven, eight, nine. These will firm up in the refrigerator too a little bit. And by the way, if you wanted to, you could toss these with uh, pasta. It'd be great, as I mentioned, in a sandwich, English muffin pizza. Are these similar to, uh, to sun-dried tomatoes? What was that? Them longer? Uh, I, I could have left these in a little longer, but they'll do. They'll do. I mean, I'm amazed that, uh, you know, I was able to get them to this point in two hours. Usually I'll go 250 and I'll keep them in there for like four or five hours. And just a recap, that was regu regular olive oil and just some salt and then uh, roasted. This was uh, uh, heirloom tomatoes, such as they are, uh, olive oil at the bottom of the pan. She's oh, yeah, yeah, I always use extra virgin olive oil. Yeah, absolutely. But what's the difference between olive oil and extra virgin? Virgin olive oil. Well, extra virgin is the first press. Ah. By the way, I like uh, uh, more ripe olive oil, fruity, as opposed to grassy. Now, Ellen Smarty Pants said that I would not be able to get that entire tray in this little munchkin. Well, Ellen, Ellen has in school there that. There you go. See, right there. Okay, so this will go there. I think I'll deal with these potatoes later because I'm about ready to have showtime on the pasta. So uh, those of you that are cooking along, along, and I think we've got two people that are cooking along. Lucy, and I think there's, uh, well, of course, Jen and, and uh, Lauren are, are hooking along. How are you guys doing in the process with uh, keep, keeping up? I'm sorry, was that a question for me? I was clanging my oven. No, I was just seeing how those that are cooking along, how they're doing, keep it. Oh, 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 yeah. good. Excellent. So I'm confused because I just saw what I think John put potatoes in the oven that I thought were done cooking. Well, they are, except I need some place to store them. Okay, good. Praise Jesus. Okay, I got you. Well, I'm with you now. I need some place to store them. I have limited capacity on my storage here. All right. Lucy, how are you doing? Oh. Lucy, you doing okay? I see you cooking over there. You're muted, but I'll unmute you. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm so ready to eat this food. Okay. And uh, now, the around me is <laughs> and, and I see we have a couple of viewers that have uh, Hell's Kitchen and some, some fire kitchens be, be behind them. So uh, I think they're taking notes and uh, are going to be uh, copying this recipe to make for their family soon. We're good on the salt. Uh, another minute on the al dente-ness. Okay, now, um, I'm going to show you a very important uh, uh, Italian Neapolitan cooking technique. Um, and here goes. Okay, we're gonna to go to the cooktop view now. Mm. 
You just shake it out. Pour it right in. Now, some of you mentioned that this was a little, uh, it, could, it turned out a little dry, some of the kale. So what you could do, is you take a ladle and put some of the glutinous pasta water uh, over the pasta and the grains and the sausage. And could you do that as the pasta is cooking as well? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure you can. So I'm throwing in two ladles full. Great tip, John, with the pasta water. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right. Now this is going to be exciting. Oh, there we go. And then you just toss it. You know, I'm a little surprised I was able to get uh, 500 grams of pasta, those two chagundo. Uh, bunches of uh, the Russian red kale and the four sausages in this five quart pan, but it's all fitting. So this is a very important technique. You remember before I told you about the uh, the ragu de sazicha, the same thing. You uh, reduce it uh, and then you throw the pasta right in the uh, pan. Toss it good. Now, Will, if you're still there, um, yes, sir. I want to lodge a complaint that is way too many greens in this pasta. So please process that complaint. Will do. Thank you. But in the, right. times we, in the times we live in, we like uh, you know all the flavors and all the colorings. <laughs> well said, well said. Okay, so I'm all out of cutting board, so I'll use this thing. That looks like a good cutting surface. So now I got my Sardinian Pecorino. And you can get the uh, Pecorino Romano uh, at a very good price and a huge uh, chunk of it over at Costco. That's good. About how much are you grading there? Half cup, quarter cup? Well, we'll see. Ish. We will see momentarily. I decided to cut some slivers instead of, okay, let's see how this works. I'm gonna go over. Okay, ready? Here goes, here we go. I think I want some more.
Okay, now I'm going to toss this. Now remember, this dish was intended to be with fennel, sweet fennel sausage, orichietti, and Brooklyn rabe. So we made adjustments, which you can do. Okay, so does everybody have this little technique now? Your you're tossing it like a salad. And we'll just cover it for a moment to let the flavors melt. And then we will finish it. I'll show you our plate one and uh, we'll finish it with some. Uh, Sardinian pecorino. Okay, so. About how much cheese was that? Was that half cup, quarter cup-ish? Uh, you keep grating until you don't want it anymore. What can I tell you? Personal preference. Okay, so. This is actually the first thing that uh, Helen and I will eat tonight. So I'll plate them. Greg Huss, Sliver Diamonds. Sliver Diamonds? Greg Huss? Yeah. There you go. Well, what the hell would you expect from a German from Chicago? Okay, so we're going to give it a little bit more Pecorino Romano on top. Oh, this is not Pecorino Romano. This is Sardinian Pecorino. And there we go, voila, we actually got through six dishes. Can you imagine it? My dishwasher is gonna work overtime tonight. Any final questions? Everybody must be eating already. Great job, John. John, yes. if you're not eating, our pasta needs just a minute more, but we are uh, salivating. <laughs> Yeah, great, great, great job, John. If you monitor the salt and all that thing is. Awesome, John. Thank you. Spencer, thank you for being a soldier. I don't know how long we went, but it was longer than two hours. That was great, John. Thank you so much. Yeah, you. Great. Spencer. Thank you for joining. I'm on my you. way. Put, put one more ball out. Two more balls. Sue and I are coming. Un appetito.